So Snowflake markets itself on making things really simple, really easy to use, reducing the administrational overhead that you often associate with this relational database management systems like SQL Server and Oracle. Um, however, departure from the simplicity of the, the capabilities that Snowflake offers is in store procedures. And I remember when I first uh, was introduced to Snowflake back in 2017, their sales guy came into the offices and uh, one of our questions during the sales process was, does Snowflake support store procedures? Because we had an on-premise Microsoft SQL Server instance. Uh, we had a lot of store procedures, quite typical in those environments to have store procedures doing a lot of transformations, um, accepting input parameters such as dates to return data for reports. And at that point in time, we were really keen to see a clear migration path and understand how easy or how challenging that might be. And a sales guy said, oh, you know, sure, of course, Snowflake supports all procedures. And then he added, uh, they're written in JavaScript. And we were like, sorry, I, I thought we misheard you. Did you mention JavaScript? Because we thought that was, you know, the staple of web developers. And yeah, it's in JavaScript. So, it was quite a surprise. Um, I never thought I'd be using JavaScript for database development. The usage of JavaScript is limited, I guess, to a d degree. You need a wrapper around your SQL code in JavaScript for it to be created as a, a function, essentially, in Snowflake. And once you understand that wrapper and you've got, a, you've got your try, catch, error blocks in there and you've got it all sorted out, you can literally just swap in and swap out SQL statements. You do need to work with the parameters and that can be a little bit tricky. But the the way that Snowflake has implemented the store procedures really feels like an afterthought to me compared to everything else. Everything else is quite seamless, quite slick and quite easy and refreshing to work with. Store procedures are absolutely none of those things. It's been introduced in JavaScript is it gives you the branching and looping um, kind of programming constructs that you don't get in the SQL code. There's no kind of curses and you, you typically try to avoid those anyway and try to do set based, pro based processing. Sometimes when that's unavoidable, then you may need to, to look at branching and looping and to extend the out of the box functionality from uh, Snowflake SQL programming language. It then gives you this JavaScript construct within store procedures and also within user defined functions. Um, however, it's just the support for it is very poor from a development and a developer perspective. The, um, the web UI for Snowflake doesn't allow you to kind of step through the code. I need any breakpoints, there's no IntelliSense. Very, very primitive and it almost reminds me of Microsoft SQL Server 2000 and the predecessor to SSIS, which was called DTS or Data Transformation Services. In that um, particular tool, you had very limited transformation capabilities. So often when you needed to do something that it didn't support out of the box, you needed to use a pop-up window and type VB code directly into that pop-up window, which was no better than Notepad in terms of what it offered. It was, was nowhere near the, the Visual Studio program environment that uh, everyone's familiar with today. So it almost strikes me that it's been an afterthought. It's added on there to provide some um, branching and looping capabilities and functionality as well as providing a path for a lot of those teams who have invested heavily in terms of time and effort building store procedures as part of their existing uh, legacy database systems whether that be on premise in sql server oracle or maybe running on the cloud now but they need a path that they can migrate that code quickly and relatively easily into snowflake and it almost feels like Snowflake recognized that quite late in the day and added this functionality in there. So in this video, it's, it's a little bit different to, to what I usually do. I'm just doing away with the slides today. I'm going to actually show you some, some code within the, the Snowflake UI, give you some examples of um, a basic example of the construct, the wrapper, if you like, of a, a JavaScript store procedure and where you put your SQL. <clears throat> and then we'll look at maybe a little bit more of a uh, an example closer to a, a real world implementation. If you're finding these videos useful, please uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. You can always change your mind later, but I'm producing content every week around Snowflake and the different capabilities. And I'm by no means a JavaScript expert, and you don't need to be one either. You just need the recipe to work with. The JavaScript which Snowflake uses is bare bones, really. For example, you can't use any third party libraries within the store procedures. Primarily, you'll just need this JavaScript elements to act as a wrapper around your SQL code. The SQL is executed within this wrapped code by calling functions on the JavaScript API. I hope this short video 
goes some way towards demystifying the topic of store procedures in Snowflake. OK, so let's just jump into the Snowflake web UI and give you a sense of what a simple store procedure looks like. So here on line 39, if I just zoom in a little bit, on line 39, we've got create or replace procedure, the name of the store procedure, and then an open and close brackets. In this case, I'm not including any input parameters, so that is empty. Store procedure in Snowflake must return a value. Uh, you need to use a, a JavaScript data type as well, and there is a mapping table on the Snowflake documentation on the official website. In this case, I've got returns float, it can't be null, language is equal to JavaScript on line 41, and at the moment for store procedures in Snowflake, the language is always JavaScript. That differs for user-defined functions where you can use different programming languages, but I might discuss that in a different video. Then we've got as on line 42, and then we break it down and, and start building in parameters and dropping the SQL statement in there. So you can see line 44, I've got a variable called command. Um, I'm assign and select one with the colon. That's where your SQL statement goes. So your SQL command statement um, from your existing store procedure, let's assume it's a simple one with no input parameters, can be dropped straight into this area here. And then line 45, okay, and then line 45, we've got another variable called SQL. This is where we call a part of the JavaScript API, where we've got snowflake.create statement. We've got SQL text, and then we call, we bring in the command variable, which we've just set in the previous line 44. That builds the statement for us in SQL. You don't necessarily have to do it in this way. We will see a, a different variation of that, where you can you can almost do it shorthand. Um, but this is the full kind of output here in terms of creating the statement up front, then creating another variable in line 46 called result, where we then execute that SQL um, statement that we've just created. I'm just going to pause for a moment, guys, where I just let you know about some useful resources and how to get in touch with me. So I've got a Udemy course, which is based around the SnowPro Code certified exam. There's a link in the comments. There's 120, 130 plus questions to help prepare you for that exam. Um, you know, I'm, I'm often producing discount codes and sharing those on LinkedIn. So if you're interested in that, please check it out. There's over two and a half thousand students already been through that course and it's really helped them um, get certified in the fastest growing database product in the cloud at the moment, which is Snowflake. And um, connect with me on LinkedIn. If you're not already, follow me and a lot of my updates go on there. And again, like and subscribe to this video if you find them useful. The other thing to mention is I've got a new book coming out soon, which is Building Solutions with Snowflake probably going to be available early 2022. We assign the uh, output of that execution to that variable result before on line 47 return and the result. And that is all that you need. So just replacing that select one on line 44 with your SQL statement. And it's quite a basic example, but that gives you an idea of how this JavaScript wrapper around store procedure works in this in this scenario. OK, so moving on to have a look at a more realistic real world scenario of a store procedure in Snowflake. So what we've got here is from lines 54 uh, down to 58, we've got we're creating a database called raw, we're creating a schema called stage, and then we're creating a table. So we're creating an initial table. I'm just being a, a little bit crafty here by using the Snowflake sample data tables and um, join them together, limiting the, the output to 100 because I just want to create a structure of a stage table really quickly um, and I'm just and I also want to join data as part of that so rather than just hang cranking the DDL out I'm just creating a table just as a starting point using the data from the Snowflake um, sample database and now I've created a table structure I'm actually going to create another couple of tables. So I'm going to create a table called load customer underscore NY for New York and load customer underscore DE for a different state. But ultimately, I end up with three separate stage tables for loading customer data. Each relates to a different two character value state. And now onto my store procedure. So basically, I've got three load customer tables. And what I want to do is create a store procedure, which I'm ultimately going to assigned to a task and schedule. As part of this store procedure, I'm going to pass in some input parameters. So I'm going to pass in a schema name, a table name, and a state 
two digit character code. They're all varchars. And you will be able to see in here, I've got the same setup. So I've got returns string, I've got language JavaScript as, and then I'm into my SQL statement. The main difference here is I'm now dealing with input variable values, which I need to concatenate into the SQL statement. I'm also moving between different lines as well, so I need to kind of build up the SQL statement and go into multi multiple lines. Carriage return in JavaScript, I understand, is a end of a new statement as well. And so I actually found this new um, symbol, which JavaScript developers are probably all over, called backticks. These are these things here, which initially I thought were single quotes. But actually, at the top left of most keyboards, underneath the escape key, your backtick is on the, the keyboard right there. And that basically allows you to um, switch between the text that you're going to build up for the SQL and back out into the JavaScript here, where it's almost a little bit like concatenating SQL. If you've ever wrote dynamic SQL and concatenating uh, parameter values into it, it's a little bit like that. So you can see. I'm using the insert override clause here, which is equivalent to a, a truncate and insert um, in, in the SQL Server world. So insert override into raw, which is my database. I'll just create a little bit further up in this code. Um, adding in the schema variable, adding in the table variable, which is obviously going to change depending on the state um, that I'm running this code for. Then I've got my select statement. <clears throat> Here, which is joining a few of the Snowflake sample tables together and just doing some basic transformations on the date of birth, just to, for illustration purposes. And then you can see in the where clause here, I'm using the variable value of state, two character code I'm passing in um, right here. The other difference you will notice from the previous example is a try catch block. You have this in other store procedure examples as well, but in this one, we're writing this in the JavaScript syntax. So you can see here, um, this is a bit more of a shorthand way of doing it from the earlier um, earlier example I showed you, where we're calling the snowflake.execute. We're passing in the SQL command here. If that succeeds, we just return a succeeded message. Otherwise, you try to catch the error and print that out and back to the caller of the store procedure. So I'm going to run the code I've just shown you. OK, so I've just ran all of that code I've just talked you through, and now I'm going to call the store procedures, and this is where it will start to make a little bit more sense. Here you can see that I'm going to call each of the store procedures in turn. I'm going to give it the schema name. I'm going to give it the table name. You can see that the two character um, suffix on the end changes as well as the value I'm passing in to restrict those records to that individual state. If I just run this as a test, take a few moments to run. Uh, essentially, that's going to populate each of those load tables with um, the customer details for each of the states from the Snowflake sample data. Okay, those three store procedures have now executed successfully. You can see in the results pane down here that it is succeeded. I am now going to run a camp star and I've got records in each of these tables. I'm not going to go through in detail of the counts, but you can see all the counts are different and those tables are populated. Now what you'd want to do uh, typically is call that store procedure and um, all those store procedures as part of a task. Here you can see I've created um, a task for the CA table here and to run every five minutes. And I call the store procedure with the input parameters in there. Um, the same again for the NY table and the same again for the DE table. Really important then uh, after you've created the tasks that you resume them. After five minutes then, those tables should then be populated, repopulated with the data. In the, in the real world, you probably want to create a stream of the source tables and then have your task check this stream for the existence of any new or updated records before it calls the store procedure so it's not doing work and moving data unnecessarily. So guys, I hope you found that run through of store procedures uh, useful. Usually I don't really go into the, the how of, of the, the actual tutorials, but this time just to illustrate the concept of store procedures, how they work, um, how you can leverage JavaScript and not need to be an expert in it, but just use it as a wrapper for the SQL code, how that can help you migrate 
um, code. It's worthwhile saying if you've got stored procedures that don't uh, require input parameters at the moment, then when you migrate them, it's probably going to be a lot easier for you to use views in Snowflake rather than stored procedures. But if you do need them um, to use input parameters and there's no other way around that, um, such as storing them in a metadata table and picking them up from there within a view, then you, you should be looking at using that wrapper in, uh, in Snowflake to try to ease that migration path. And then it's perhaps after that you can look into it. Hope you enjoyed this. I hope you find it useful. Um, again, like, subscribe, comment, hit the bell icon, new content coming every week.